Upon this battle depends the survival of Christian civilization. But what does it mean for the language to be pure? Or when people say they want English to be pure, what are they talking about? Is Shakespeare pure? I mean, uh, in fact, uh, every stage of history, when there is there is no such thing as a language. There are lots of things that are speaking that different people have. They will still say, this is the language of the And welcome to episode number three of the Everything Keys. I am your host, John, and I am joined once again by Nathan of the Corollary and the Exertus Discord. How are you, Nathan? Good. It's been it's been a while since we got to do this, so it's good to be back. Yeah. Yeah. The holiday insanity with my wife being off school. For a few weeks, that changes the schedule, and uh, of course, you had some things that you had to take care of. That, and we both pretty much had to acquire a vehicle during that that break, which um, pretty much was no fun for either one of us. So, <laughs> it looks like we're going to be back to uh, a pretty normal uh, hitting this every two weeks, though, from from here on out to the foreseeable future. Is that correct? Oh yes, indeed. Fantastic. Okay. Well, today we were going to be going from page 55, which the uh, that section is the Hebraic Grammar Chapter 1 General Principles, Part 1, the real purpose of this grammar. The next section is etymology and definition. And then the final section that we're going to cover is division of grammar or parts of speech. Now, <clears throat> I got to tell you, it. first off, I liked how brief these sections were. Uh, sometimes when somebody's trying to outline something that's, well, the concepts that are potentially as broad as these concepts, you almost can't help uh, but being extremely verbose. And in this instance, uh, D'Alave kept it pretty concise. He does, however, insert um, theories and claims that are certainly going to require the the voluminous amount of work that follows this, I believe, just to prove. And of course, I, I personally don't think he proves all of them because I differ in some ways. But I definitely think that um, we could go on if we didn't stop ourselves. We could certainly go on concerning just the, uh, the claims in, in these three sections for a very long time and we're going to do our best to squeeze it into one shot <laughs> which i don't think will be easy but um i actually think everything he wrote in these three sections are so uh, they're so to the point and they're so important and and oftentimes profound that i would even see it as justifiable to read this whole thing if we weren't constrained for time which we are, but I could see it as justifiable in reading it all word for word because he packs in quite a lot in three small sections. Um, the first thing, of course, is paragraph two in, in the first section. 
I highlighted a couple of sentences there because I thought it was pretty astonishing that he uh, he reflects, or since he wrote this a couple hundred years ago, I've been reflecting a point of view that he wrote back then, which is the fact that we're going to have a hard time, if not completely impossible, in entirely translating, um, and, and which is where the term, of course, lost in translation comes from, what is in the original language or what is being expressed and how it's being expressed in Obrey into English. He says in, in paragraph number two, starting in the second sentence, does one not feel that it is not a question of giving to modern thoughts an exterior which has not been made for them, but on the contrary of discovering under a worn out exterior ancient thoughts worthy to be revived under more modern forms? Thoughts are for all time and all places and all men. It is not thus with the tongues which express them. These tongues are appropriate to the customs, laws, understanding, and periods of the ages. They become modified in proportion as they advance in the centuries. They follow the course of the civilization of peoples. When one of these has ceased to be spoken, it can only be understood through the writings which have survived. What do you think of that? I did the exact same thing you did. <laughs> yeah. I wrote a half a page of thoughts based on that half a page you just read. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> it's that was actually thought provoking. And so it was a great way to open the chapter, I think. Mm -hmm. But, um, I'll just read it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> to revisit and seek to know and speak is to resuscitate a dead body long extinguished. Do we seek to unearth the corpse and revive the dead body of the word? Is the word, as its people were, now dead? Is it not living? And if so, how might it yet live? I mean, that's, that's the question of the whole purpose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And... Immediately following, should we be the ones to make a case against a case against our own selves? Um, now, in this, he he says, thoughts are for all time, all places, and all men. It's not thus with the tongues which express them. Mm -hmm. Now, this is. This is a common argument you hear with, with sermons the world over. Mm -hmm. When they say it's not the word, it's the spirit of the word. It's the spirit of the law, not the letter of the law. Mm -hmm. Things like this. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, to begin it, he does the very thing which we've all been doing. And he questions what it is that we're trying to do and says that it's useless <laughs> if we're going to try to recreate we yeah. can only try to understand yeah yeah and, and in a way uh i find that to be correct at least with knowing what i know about my own language and not having spoken with anyone who speaks one or more other languages um, I don't know that there's one currently in existence which is going to be able to to capture um, the same essence of what's being captured um, in non Masoretic Obery. Um, and and that's one of the things that I've lamented a lot is that I think that um, I think that once the the forms and exactly the the thoughts how they are being relayed is known that somebody who has a very good command of the english language is probably going to be able to express those in a pretty complete way but i don't think it's going to be entirely complete uh i've found myself 
as I come to be more and more and more familiar with the language, when I look at it, I'm no longer looking at it like if I'm reading English. When I'm reading English, and of course, he's going to get into these forms of um, what he believes. Uh, it, he's he's continuing to call it, it, it Hebrew. Um, I'm probably going to have to insist that that he's going for Obri as well. Um, the, the biggest problem between him and I um, phonetically is that he is willing to stick with the Masoretic pronunciations. But, you know, the, the thing is, um, in, let me see how I, I, I can put this with, with where he's going with this. Um, cause I completely lost my train of thought. I was trying to read ahead while I was saying that. Where was I? <laughs> <laughs> I do that all the time. <laughs> Where the heck was I? I don't um, know. Uh, his claims based on forms and how he's willing to stick with Masoretic translation mm-hmm. with, uh, their pronunciation. That's right. And I was talking about how I read it more and more. And what I see is the fact that, um, you, you're you're not going to end up reading. You can read Hebrew. You can read Masoretic Hebrew uh, in the way that you read English, and that's not a problem because it has uh, very similar components. There are only a few that are a bit different. You know, you have masculine and feminine, uh, which, of course, if you're somebody who's familiar with Germanic or a lot of other languages that aren't English, you'll have those forms too. Um, but the thing is, when you when you take away the Masoretic and you start reading it as Obri, it's so odd the way that um, a picture language begins to form. And we're, we're going to talk later more about forms uh, because he does make claims concerning what he believes the parts of Obri are. Um, so I can save those for later, too. But... That's that's one of the hardest things to have to tell people is, look, uh, I know for a fact, and I can tell just by looking at the Masoretic, and first off, how inconsistent it is. Uh, secondly, um, Jews claim in their own publications, very, very solid publications, like Encyclopedia Judaica, um, Jewish Encyclopedia, uh, Rabbinic Writings, they, they make the claim that no, the, the Masoretes didn't standardize uh, back from the 7th to, to the 10th century. We had to re-standardize it basically with uh, the Codex Leningrad uh, a few centuries ago, probably four or five centuries ago, I, I would suppose. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, and there I lost it again. I'm sorry, there's so much going on at my house <laughs> No worries. I'm trying to keep away from the recording. No, that <laughs> I'm, I'm multitasking you, way too much here. What uh, you say ahead. about the um, about taking away the Masoretic and reading it as Obery? This is this is a huge difference in language, and I I see this everywhere. Um, but um, like today in the news. And let's go talk about geopolitics. Good job, Nathan. There is a document that was that was presented as evidence um, in the news, and some people began to take a look at it. And yes, it's written in Arabic. Mm-hmm. However, and and it's uh, bulleted and numbered, and the numbers are correct. The forms are correct, but Arabic is right to left, and the perforated holes on the page are on the left side, as if someone writing a Western language wrote this Arabic Mm -hmm. instead of the other way around. Not Mm -hmm. only that, but the paragraphs are A, B, C, instead of the Arabic progression of their alphabet mm-hmm. so the the document is written in perfect arabic however translators looked at it and immediately saw that it was 
<laughs> it was written like an English document. Yeah. And this is this is testament to the style and type. I mean, the Masoretic is basically anglis, anglicized ovary. Mm -hmm. It's ovary in the style of an Englishman. Or you could just say that English and the uh, the progression of our modern Germanic languages, and I think more than just the Germanic languages, the, the progression of a number of languages around the world, I think they all have the fingerprints on them. When I began studying Greek, I saw it as well in Koine Greek, the same fingerprints on them of the same sort of form and mind behind them as what you see in Masoretic Hebrew, as opposed mm -hmm. to reading the language without. And and when you read the language without, that, that's the one thing. So we have so many um, types of forms in, in English, which, again, we'll see here before we get to the end of this. Um, and it's probably why I've, I've compared speaking pure obri to um, ASL. Because ASL doesn't have... It, it, ASL, if you were to mechanically translate a lot of ASL, it would sound like pigeon talk. And I think there's something to be said for pigeon talk. Some people say it like it's like it's something ignorant. You know, like when you hear the the caricatures of of Indians and in old westerns speaking mm -hmm. in in a in a pigeon English, right? Uh they describe it almost as if that's a negative. Uh however, uh, I beg to differ. I suppose if you already have a pre-existing language and somebody takes that and they they don't put in those things, first off, you have to wonder why they do that. They don't do that because in a lot of other languages, they're considered extras. They're fluff. They're, they're unneeded. They're points of confusion. First flowery. off. They're flowery. They are. They're not necessary not to understand what's being relayed. And at first, at first, most of the people that are speaking these modern languages, especially English, that have these sort of forms where we just expect, we just have to have words like of, or we fall apart. Um, those just aren't needed. We need punctuation or we fall apart. There's not punctuation in here. Okay. There are words that act as punctuation. Um, it's it's a whole different thing. And and that's why when you can start to understand how different the form is, um, I don't think anybody can, should necessarily get um, depressed that it can never be brought into a modern language. But it's never going to be brought into a modern language in the same spirit, in the same way, exactly, um, as it exactly. was... At the time, I just don't know that that's possible in, entirely. That's, that's what happens when you lose something. When I said I'd written a half a page based on this first bit of ideas, it's because while I agree with with Dolive, I don't. Um, take Japanese culture, for instance. Mm -hmm. They are so steeped in tradition and exactitude. The perfection and remembrance of every deed and its history and the why. Yeah. The reason it exists and we know it as such and it is so distinct is because no one ever forgot to learn why. And so mm -hmm. let's say all of that dies for a generation. Then whatever replaces it or whatever is found and attempted to be recreated will be something entirely different. And mm -hmm. so it's with it's with the gap in tradition, the generation shuffle, the mm -hmm. regular genocide of different peoples. It just mm -hmm. takes one generation and everything is completely different. Mm -hmm. But why why do we have tradition which everyone tells our youth that we need to that we need to get away from tradition no tradition is the remembrance of yeah that is a, a yeah. kata or a, a purification ceremony before any martial art 
It's yeah. not just flowery. It is, it's keeping it alive. I'm sure the same people who are telling us that we need to do away with traditions today are the same that have been telling generations uh, of old the same thing. Yes. I'm sure that's precisely how um, one language form was replaced with another, was replaced with another, until many people forgot where they came from, what they used to speak, and who they used to be, how the world once was. And of course, inherent in the language is a philosophy. There is a mindset in any given language, as I've said before, it's sort of a baggage that comes along with a language. That's not always baggages in the negative. It's, um, it's just a, it's a worldview and an understanding that is particular to any given language type. And if you lose that language and language type, unfortunately, I'm afraid you lose that mind and that mindset. They have programmed a particular mindset with particular baggage into us via the English language, and they continue to do so. Um, and yes, could you... Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I just, I, I think that uh, in one way we would be remiss um, by doing away with what traditions we do currently have. But in another way, I kind of wonder if it wouldn't be to an advantage for us to go back to the old forms, rediscover them, and put our minds back in those places, which as far as I'm concerned are not nearly as polluted as all of the the language and therefore mental philosophical forms that we have today are. Go ahead. Yeah. That, that was all I want to say. This it touches right on what I was thinking about. Could you imagine if we just deleted two words from our lexicon for a generation, how it would change the entire thought processes <laughs> of the mm -hmm. American people, if no one for an entire generation ever heard the word sir or ma'am. Yeah. This, the <clears throat> word sir and the word ma'am, it is uh, a display of respect, but also teaches you who to respect and how. And so this is, this is a sociological lesson that is embedded in our language. Now, when those began to change, when it began to be socially acceptable to call someone old timer or mm. old man or mm. anything like that, without being reprimanded, we lost that lesson. Mm. Yeah. And so this, I mean, this happens through the, the alteration of our lexicon in the media every single day. Mm hmm. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, it's funny, as we've been talking, and this is part of the reason that I lose myself sometimes, I'm um, constantly reading ahead <laughs> to, uh, to, you know, to try to smoothly go on to the next point. Something that is, um, is interesting is, is he's really, from that point, and I noticed this when I first reviewed uh, this material when we were going to get together about a week or so ago. And I noticed that from this point, this first paragraph, second paragraph forward, he really does not a lot other than to strengthen what he's saying in that first paragraph. Uh, and uh, let's see, it, at least for the next couple of pages, as far as as I'm concerned, um, that's mostly what he's doing. Now, I'm going to try to I was actually scrolling through here and uh, and mildly lost my place, but I'm back now. Um, now this is interesting. I don't, I don't know that it's it's a I don't know that it's a huge point or that it's it's something that a lot of time needs to be spent on, but I think it's important and it's important enough. On page fifty eight, he writes, "When I say that the rabbis of the synagogues have put themselves beyond the state." of defending their lawgiver, and he's speaking of Moses, I wish to be understood that I speak only to those who 
holding to the most meticulous observances of the Mazora. So the Mazora is the entire system of all of their dots and dashes and cantillation marks that they have put on top of the, the pure language. Mm-hmm. Have never penetrated the secret of the sanctuary. Doubtless there are many to whom the genius of the Hebraic tongue is not foreign, but a sacred duty imposes upon them an inviolable silence. It is said that they hold the version of the Hellenists in abomination. They attribute to it all the evils which they have suffered. Alarmed at its use against them by the Christians in the early ages of the church, their superiors forbade them thereafter to write the Sefer in other characters than the Hebraic, and doomed to execration those among them who should betray the mysteries and teach the Christians the principles of their tongue. One ought therefore to mistrust their exterior doctrine. Those of the rabbis who were initiated kept silence, as Moses, son of Maimon, called Maimonides, expressly said, those who were not had as little real knowledge of Hebrew as the least learned of the Christians. And I really hope everyone listening really understood what he's saying there. (laughs) Take it in. He said, and I could I could reduce it in a sentence or two. I mean, what do you think of exactly what he's telling us? I, I think it's delicious. Uh, mm-hmm. I remember I said in our last conversation, the the thing about having a secret weapon isn't actually having it. It's having other people know you have it, whether it exists or not. This is it. Mm-hmm. He, he basically beware the tricks mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and he's telling us that again I don't think anybody could accuse Dialave of being anti-Jewish I, he makes some statements concerning rabbis uh, you know concerning Masoretics um, you know as, as far as last time I checked not every Jew was a rabbi uh, or even cared about uh, Masoretic punctuation uh, in Hebrew. Um, however, he is, it seems very clear when we're talking about anyone having to do with religious Judaism that these people are, unless I've mistaken his words, these people are, the, in the truest sense, a secret society. Because he believes that there are those among them that absolutely still understand the original tongue. And out of those, you will never hear one of them ever teach anyone that tongue. Not out in the open, not publicly, not even at the synagogues. He even tells you, you know, if you want somebody that's going to teach you uh, modern Hebrew and not elucidate on what the original form was, go see a rabbi at a synagogue. But if you want to know what it actually is, you're not going to get that from them because those who know aren't telling. And those who tell don't know. Or they do know and they're misleading. Maimonides might have actually been one of those guys. Based on his attitude things he's written um how uh very anti goyim maimonides was and he wasn't a dumb guy and based on the fact that he knows very much about these things and he expresses that i wouldn't be surprised if he was one I so i thought agree. that would be an interesting point to put in there yeah i don't know that this language is necessarily lost It's just lost to us. It's just lost to the Goyim. But lost? I'm not sure about that. It's just like the old maps, ancient geography, manners and customs, all of that information. Who says it's lost? We just, it's not available to the public. (laughs) Right. And 
if you if you really want to know the truth of things, all you need to do is be a billionaire and visit private book collections. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's not oh, like yeah. it's gone. Oh yeah. It isn't. And and prime example that no one can shut up about the basement archives of the Vatican. Mm. There we are. That's it's one. Not, it's not gone. None of it's gone. It's yeah. just been replaced with harmlessness. Yeah. That is most of the information available to us today is harmless to anyone in power. Why is it every war that any empire who have been puppeted by the same people for the at least the last five centuries, every time they invade uh, a new place, uh, have war on a new people, uh, one of the quiet things that they do, but they always do, is raid the museums, the libraries, uh, not in some insane, destructive, burn it down way. They collect, they get rid of. I don't think they're just, it's not as though, like there were all these stories about um, us violating uh, museums and libraries and sources of information in Iraq when we went in there years ago. <laughs> I don't Lebanon. think that was necessarily, and we, we do it pretty much about everywhere. There's, there's always at least whispers about it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's necessarily because we don't necessarily have that information and we really need it. In some ways, maybe they have information that the people pulling the strings just don't want in circulation. Um, but I think that's that's more it than than anything is they're working towards with every war, with every museum sacked, with every library burnt. They're working us towards their ideal dark age. Yes, there's there's only one sentence that people always say, what's the goal? What's the purpose? What what are these evil controllers doing? Well, no, not evil controllers. This is the constant trudge toward a single sentence. You've always been a slave. Mm -hmm. You've always been a slave. What do mm -hmm. you mean? You have no history. It, your history is your servitude, your serfdom. And now when... When this iconoclasm takes place, they're taking away the memory of something other than your current position. And yeah. this is this, <laughs> that's, it. that's it. There's only yeah. one sentence. You've always been a slave. Yeah. It's just like in The Matrix. Um, and I hate to go back. I know that's become such a meme. I understand that. The, the thing is, not it's too many people. It's true. Yeah, not too many people have have really pulled off um, what the Wachowski brothers did in the Matrix movies as far as what they communicated in them. And, you know, if you're paying really close attention and then you do some good hard work in the real world, you'll see that they were communicating things that were far deeper than most average viewers even understand they were trying to say. So I guess it's kind of hard not to meme on that. Because it's 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 one of the uh, most prolific pop culture iconic messages to everyone. You you are a slave. You always have been. And I even felt like I needed to retract immediately when I said it, leading us to their perfect dark age, leading us further, further. They they want to get us to a mm -hmm. point we're not quite at yet. It's just like people saying the New World Order is coming. No, 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 no. It's been here for a long time. Yeah. Okay? It's just they're moving. They're moving in slow increments because they learned a long time ago when they move fast, it goes badly. They're, so they're just maintaining the status quo, a little move, a little move at the time. And 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 all they have to do, this has been their pattern, okay? You, you take away... You take away an inch and people cry out 
And then all you have to really do is give them back seven eighths or 15 sixteenths and they're okay. And they don't even realize that you gained a sixteenth to an eighth of an inch on them. Yeah. This that's is how it's always been moving. That's the, uh, you remember the story of the, the four walls, uh, that pen the sheep. It's, uh, Remind me. maybe I do. Go there, ahead. there are sheep in a field and every day they come to graze. And one day the farmer builds a wall while they're away. Just one, just one little fence wall. And they come and they see this wall, but nothing happens. So they continue to graze. They wander off and they come back the next day and there's a second wall built. And they don't go too close to it, but that's all right. They graze, nothing bad happens. And the farmer builds a third fence wall. And they come and they stand in that field and everything is still okay. And when they wake up in the morning, there's a fourth wall, but nothing's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, that's it. Profound. Profound. Yeah. Um, I also think it's, it is worthy of note um, in the context of this chapter to point out that he does say that St. Jerome and Luther, who are agreed in saying that the words of this tongue are equivocal to such an extent that it is often impossible to determine the meaning. Origen, according to him, was persuaded of this truth. Calvin felt it, a car, uh, Calvin felt it and Cardinal Cajetan himself was convinced. I'm going to read a little bit uh, more and then tell you what my notes were on this. And Father Morin, who took advantage of this obscurity to consider the authors of the Septuagint version as so many prophets. Kind of like today, they, they do with the King James Version. For he said, God had no other means of fixing the signification of the Hebrew words. And doesn't that sound familiar? It sounds like the same voices have designed the King James only argument that were designing the Septuagint argument in his day. Now, in my notes, what I wrote was equivocal. And I defined it open to two or more interpretations and often intended to conceal the truth, a synonym ambiguous. Yes, as it currently manifests itself in calligraphic block form with Mazora and the parsing of the rabbis. Descriptive geographical features are often being masked as a place, name, and vice versa. Numbers 2241 and Ashdut Episka and the Ashad Anahalim. Now, what that is is there is if you if you read the Bible and it doesn't matter you could read you could read the Septuagint you could read say Brenton's uh, translation of the Septuagint you could read the King James or or a number of other uh, modern English versions and you're going to see that they do this now Ashdut it's got an ending that is said to be a feminine plural and sometimes it works like that but it doesn't always work like that. It's the same thing with the YM ending being said to be a, a masculine plural. Um, they turn that because, because there's too many equivocations and Masoretic doesn't help that. And the fact is, there seem to be equivocations just built into the language itself. That's why there can be a dozen, well, close, let's say, close to a dozen entries on one word that's spelled exactly the same. So in one case, you have a place called Ashtot Episka, and in another place, you have the Ashad and Nahalim, which is translated the brooks of the river or the brooks of the valley, or some translate it as the slopes of the river. Nobody really knows but they know enough to know that it's supposed to be a descriptive feature, not a proper name. We In just don't know what it <clears throat> describes. And that's part of the whole reason of getting to know what the glyphs represent and what they do. <laughs> because it's just, 
you know, there's so many wild guesses out there. It's it's, it's insane. Um, yeah, and, and so what did I do? And I basically just stayed with that. Or the, there was the study I did not that long ago on Oreb, and and that actually has probably about a dozen different entries. And and some of them are actually just put the the feminine on the end, the eh or a bay. Um, you know, what well, well what is it? it? I mean, is aura morning, blanket, surety, a people type, their encampment? And that's exactly what they're saying. That's what these authors were saying about the equivocation. And the problem is, we're forced, unless we're willing, unless we're willing to question the uh the intent of the Masoretes, and I don't see why anybody wouldn't. We're stuck. We're stuck with this, and we're not going to go forward at all. This is just pretty much what he's saying that they said. It's not well published. It's not well known. That so many people, even people that I think are very questionable, like Luther and Calvin, they admitted these things. It's it's prevalent. And how can you ever expect any thinking rational convert to come over once they've looked at such things? I mean, to keep it this way is, well, I guess most people don't look any deeper. And so you skip over no. a few issues and you reel back and you look at the broader picture. This is where they would say, have faith. Yeah. Have faith in the Masoretes. Have but faith in must. the rabbis. <laughs> have faith in the rabbis. This is it really, this sort of thing, it, it, it is honestly why I, years ago, when I would start reading any portion of the Bible, just about, uh, you know, a heavy spot of drool would form on the corner of my mouth. My eyes get very, very heavy because it was just about meaningless. Um, and I can't say that I thought any different of it as hard as I tried uh, until I started removing the assumptions um, and that's, that's been one of the most exciting things for me. Um, I really wish a lot more people would do that, at least try it because there's a lot of things that can be done without actually having to look at all of these words as individual glyphs and how they work together and what they're exactly saying. You know, there's so many cross-reference checks that can be done. There's so many root identifications that are not made in any concordance today that can be done. There's a lot of work that can be done in this language, even before we know exactly what the glyphs mean and exactly what their relationship and nature is with one another. And that's going to open this whole thing up so much as, uh, as more discoveries are made. I don't even understand why why more people aren't wanting to make those kind of discoveries. Because again, no matter what anybody thinks, no matter what anybody's opinion of the Bible is, whether they believe it is inspired and it is true or they believe it's not, the one thing that's hard to argue is the impact on knowing precisely what it says on our understanding of the world, history, who we are, a lot of things, sciences um, are going to be drastically revised once the language, the words can be proven that they are exactly this thing and what exactly this thing is by knowing precisely what the glyphs are in their relationship to one another. This. Now, go ahead. <laughs> I am, there's something infuriating about that long process, but you have, I would argue, armies of people that 
that commit these books and translations and concordances to memory and treat them as if the truth will be found there and they will be the ones to find it when no other has. And yet assume that the tools they're using toward this task are completed works. And what's the definition of insanity? We all know it. Everybody knows it. <laughs> we don't even have to repeat it because everybody knows it. Exactly. You know, you, you've either been forced into a 12 step program or some smart aleck has, has told you what the definition of insanity is, you know. So we all know, and that's exactly what's being done in this case in the studying of, of this language, in the studying of the Bible, whether it's New or Old Testament, in these languages. You know, and, and of course, I, I haven't even been able to get to get into Koine Greek, which I, I don't know how much of the New Testament was actually written in Koine Greek, really. Um, but again, that has a whole set of, uh, of luggage that comes with that, too. Um, the last little highlight I, I'd actually made in this chapter is uh, where D. Olive says in the last page, 59, second paragraph, he saw clearly that it would be necessary to study this tongue in a manner very different from the one hitherto adopted, and far from making use of the grammars and dictionaries available, he regarded them, on the contrary, as the most dangerous obstacles. For he says these grammars and these dictionaries are worth nothing, all those who have had occasion to apply their rules and to make use of their interpretations have felt their insufficiency. Forster, who had seen the evil, sought in vain the means to remedy it. He lacked the force for that. Both time and men, as well as his own prejudices, were too much opposed. He's saying a lot of what we just said I've told people this. Maybe some people who are listening to this, they, they haven't heard it. I think I'd, I'd said it in one video. It's not easy to find the audio materials. And when I give this source, remember that this source is extremely biased to King James onlyism, which I'm very against for obvious, obvious reasons. But a guy named Christopher Johnson, uh, I think he still has an organization called something like Creation Evidences, kind of like the Kent Hovind dinosaur thing, which is what it, he really started on. But since he's so radically KJV only, he did a series, and I think he still has a YouTube channel up. If not, I think you can go and find his site, Christopher Johnson, the, the creation evidences and dinosaurs. And all of these um, blog entries and the audios are all on there. He did a series on all of the major lexicons and concordances. And who were behind them? Who, who these people were? Who was, who was strong? Who was Thayer? Who are these people that wrote these these definitive concordances and lexicons, because that's important. You always want to know who wrote something. You know, if they're a, a, a madman, that's probably going to factor into how you take them at their word. Uh, and it's most revealing that D'Alevé himself says that all of those things are really just an obstacle. The best they are, for instance, if you if you use a Strong's, a Strong's in conjunction with uh, a King James translation will find you the place in which many words are. It's going to give you a really bad definition of those words, usually. Um, it's typically going to give you what the King James translators use which some tools, for instance, like eSword and the KJC, is very interesting because then you can actually see with any given word, and unfortunately the entries in Strong's and the way they parse words is horrible, but you can, it's, you can still see any given entry, how it was used, 
where it was used at. And, you know, you can begin to at least figure out why. In Esword, you can toggle back and forth, of course, between English, Greek, Latin, Obery, Masoretic Hebrew, you know, you name it. So there are some relatively useful tools, but I completely understand what he's saying as far as lexicons, dictionaries, these concordances. They're really more of an obstacle than anything else. Do you have anything yeah. more to say about this section before we go on to the next, Nathan? No, I think I said it before we got into it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's just, I think it's beautiful. Nobody ever brings up that argument. You'll hear uh, a thousand times over why you shouldn't trust the Baconian Bible. And and I don't think it should be called the King James. Man disappears <laughs> yeah. with a book for a year, comes back with a heavier book, and then spends the rest of his life uh, revitalizing secret societies all over the world. And mm. this is the man that you trust with your word. But nobody ever says who was strong. Mm -hmm. Did that guy spend a year in a cave smoking peyote? Nobody knows. Nobody questions those sources. So this is actually, um, it's, it's quite validating. Yeah, you can, you can Wikipedia a lot of these guys too. And, and if you have eyes to see, if you have eyes to see just their Wikipedia entry, you can, you can extract a lot from it about these guys. Um, so it's a, this is interesting section two and is, is etymology and definition. Now th this is where we, we might get into some things that are, that are a bit more in depth. Um, the first thing to note is this in his first paragraph, he uses three words that he's essentially claiming to be Obrey words. He says the real etymology is found in the root and he lists these three words. He lists ger, which is a, it is an Obrey word. He, he lists car and he lists kir. And they're not actually words. They're, they're phonetics for sure, because we can see how the G, a K, and a Q sound are, are phonetically so similar that they're going to translate similarly. He says, which in Hebrew, Arabic, or Chaldaic presents always the idea of engraving, uh, of character or of writing, and which as verb is used to express according to the circumstances, the action of engraving or characterizing or writing or proclaiming, of reading, of declaiming. Uh, the Greek word is uh, grammatica, uh, signifying properly the science of characters, that is to say of the characteristic signs by meaning of which man expresses his thought. Now, the thing about that is this. Those words that he gives, those three words in calligraphic Hebrew block style, those don't really have anything to do with what he's saying in the rest of the paragraph. For any, I, If anyone was looking at that and was kind of confused, didn't know where to find them or what exactly they meant because he doesn't really define them, they have nothing to do with what he's saying in the rest of that paragraph. The only thing I could figure is that perhaps he's just making an example of their phonetic similarity. I have no idea. Um, uh, but, go ahead. So the first paragraph is an explanation of the definition of grammar and how he believes the word grammar came to have its current import yes mm -hmm. now what about what about those three characters ger kar kir um has any significance to the act of structure yeah um that's the thing like um Gare is is used as as a as a traveler, um, and I also looked up to see if I could find uh, just a pure a pure form of uh, car as in K R car, and there's two words 
Uh, that's Strong's H37-33. And I'm going to punch that in real quick. The thing is, none of these things seem to have anything to do with one another. Uh, for instance, when you go to car, it, it says uh, a Hauda, a, a palanquin basket saddle. It could be a pasture or meadow. Um, in fact, it's used for um, camel furniture in, in one instance of it, or <laughs> fat, of, fat of lambs, or lambs. Wow. Car is used for lambs. Uh, or it's a measure. You'll you'll see it translated as core. So now Ger is a traveler, and it's usually a traveler who is a racial kinsman, but happens to just be not settled down. It would be different than like a Zur uh, is actually an alien, so they would be uh, racially different. Um, let's see, and then the last one being K. Air, cure. Uh, we have mm, we have it in seventy twenty three, and again, let's see, in seventy one nineteen. So let's see, seventy twenty three and seventy one nineteen. Right, a cure is is a wall. Or a side. It's translated usually as sides. Um, like for instance, uh, her house was upon the town wall or the kir, the 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 side of a city. David David went even to the wall. So sometimes it's used as wall. Sometimes it's used as side. Uh, so again, this wouldn't have anything to do with the the last two things that he said. That's why I had to assume that the reason he put those three words in was simply to demonstrate something phonetic. Because they didn't really have anything to do with what he was saying about grammar as far as I saw it. It really threw me. And that's why I put that in, in case it throws anybody else, because those three would seem to have absolutely nothing to do with one another. Are you are you still with me? Oh, yeah, I'm here. Oh, okay. I'm, okay. I'm reading the following sentence because yeah. uh, where once I dismiss this paragraph as an infographic that meant nothing, nothing to me, like a mm -hmm. factoid. Um, now I'm thinking... Um, Character of writing, a verb to express, a circumstance, and basically doing, claiming. And so I can't see, yeah, I can't see even based on that how those three characters are prime examples of those points. Yeah. Yeah. No clue. The only thing I know is that, that you know, they're all phonetically similar, you know. The word grammar has come down to us from the Greeks, right? Grammar. Um, perhaps what he's saying now, that's one thing with Greek. If you want to get into Greek, there are so many different forms of Greek uh -huh. that um, perhaps he was just citing the first two characters. See, in Greek, the first two characters are gamma and rho in grammatica. And perhaps he was just showing how the uh, the Hebrew would be similar in those first two characters, depending on the style of Greek that you're reading. Are you reading Attic Greek? Are you, you know, reading Koine Greek, Ancient Greek? Um, there's a lot of Homeric Greek. There's a lot of different kinds of Greek. So perhaps that's what he was getting at. I'm not sure. It's, I'm still scratching my head over it. I do think that the, what he says in the next paragraph is really intriguing. He says, of all the archaeologists, he's talking about this character, Court de Gabelin, which he ma he mentions him a few times. I did not have the, the really the time or inclination to go too far into who Court de Gabelin was. But he said, of all the archaeologists, has penetrated deepest into the genius of tongues. There exist two kinds of grammars. The one, universal. Now, this is going to be a big thing with him, what he's saying here. Uh, and the other, particular. 
The universal grammar, grammar reveals the spirit of man in general. The particular grammars develop the individual spirit of a people, indicate the state of its civilization, its knowledge, and its prejudices. The first is found upon nature and rests upon the basis of the universality of things. The others are modified according to opinion, places, and times. All the particular grammars have a common basis by which they resemble each other and which constitutes the universal grammar from which they emanate. For, says this laborious writer, quote, these particular grammars, after having received the life of the universal grammar, react in their turn upon their mother, to which they give new force to bring forth stronger and more fruitful offshoots. Now, I did note at this point that if this be true, Obery is the universal, whereas now he would have a different opinion. Whereas countless grammars have been fractured off of in time, one could even argue that it was the universal before Babel, as so many Euro alphabets are in close harmony with it. Now, we're just going to have to let time and the testing of this be the tell, because, of course, um, the Olivet would believe that it was far more particular. Uh, and, of course, he already argued before this that it was changed, he believed, changed in his uh, incorrect assertion that they were in Egypt, um, changed there. So, obviously, he's probably going to be arguing for the particular, not the universal. Perhaps he, he thinks that it would then be... Um, Chinese, and well, obviously and to say Ugr and Sanskrit would be the, maybe more universal for him, which is weird too, because since they have their own religious books and philosophies, I would see them as particular too. I don't know what it's going to take to get him to commit to something that he believes is universal. Maybe he thinks well, that we don't even have anything universal. I think what he's saying with this... Um, because I, I actually reread this part about uh, the kinds of grammars. And now, as far as the grammar, if we go back to what he said about it, it's the science of the crafting of sentence, the conveyance of idea. And so a universal conveyance versus a particular conveyance, which by his very first chapters, when he speaks of uh, Chinese and Sanskrit as well, Sanskrit is the ultimate particular grammar because mm -hmm. it's been so flowery that it's that it's oblique now. Yeah. It requires so much because so many particulars exist. Whereas the simpler a thing is, the more universal it must be in order to be conveyed. Well, if he's if he's attempting to apply ideas of grammar over the ideas that he's already expressed concerning uh, languages being dead and not reproducible in another form, um, then I would understand what he was getting at with universal in particular. If he means that by saying that thoughts are universal to all men. Thoughts are for all men at all times and them being basically the same or similar as opposed to language being particular to certain men at certain times. Perhaps that's really just what he's doing in a grammatical context this time. Well, um, so a particular grammar could be New York slang or California Valley Girl accent and slang using the idiom specific to our time. And now if anything is going to get lost in the wash, so to speak, it will be all of our slang built on things. Like Will Smith has a song where he talks about not knowing how to use a CD-ROM to put into a computer for his son. In mm -hmm. 50 years, nobody's going to understand what, what those lyrics mean. I hope not. <laughs> 
<laughs> but that's just it. That is particular. And so yeah. Universal yeah. wouldn't bother with that. So the like with the Chinese and Japanese uh, and their strong adherence to tradition, that would owe to a more universal type, less less likely to be lost. In that sense, then I would have to say if if he's talking if he's if he's talking in in the way that that I'm assuming now perhaps he is then i would have to say that yeah even obrey would wouldn't be particularly universal you would have some things that i i think that we're going to end up finding are relatively universal forms as far as <sighs> forms of of alphabet obviously there obviously there are vocalizations that are relatively universal as well we can only do so many things with our mouths you know sounds that we can make um you know i know some people's make some very odd sounds um oh, yeah. uh for instance um oh what is it um the language that the zulu speak they often put odd consonants together and even in Obri, I mean, there's going to be some consonantal sounds that aren't particularly comfortable or normal or, or even actually vowel sounds that are very uncomfortable, not normal. Um, people have gotten very used to hearing um, Hebrew and are very not used to hearing what is likely the vocalizations of Obery. Um, but those are things that are probably far more universal, whereas in oh, ideas, um, ways people thought, eh, uh, and not entirely like, um, it would just be, I think, based on, like I said, I think at the beginning of this, um, there would be, I think, thoughts and actions and worldviews that are dictated by the language itself. I do think thoughts are pretty universal, and there, there's nothing new under the sun. Um, so I guess um, he really isn't. I don't know if he could be saying that there's, there's actually a language, or, or if he's saying that some languages get far closer to universal forms or far closer to better expressing universal uh -huh. forms than others. And, um, well, back to his previous sentence, all the particular grammars have a common basis by which they resemble each other and which constitutes the universal grammar from which they emanate. It's like uh, Latin would be the universal from which all of its children have been born which is why yeah. they all have the similarities mm -hmm. and this is how the if the the ovary is the universal then the chaldaic aramaic are the particulars that developed from could be yeah could be i would have to say that most of the points i'm observing he's making are uh, in a way i think leading to what he's going to lay out as far as the the change that language in general, maybe not all of them, but I think in general, the languages that the Western world, who is now and has been for a while um, leading most of the world in thought, have gone through. Um, I did highlight quite a bit in... Uh, the next couple of pages, some of it might be more uh, benign than others. Um, I'll try to just go over the portions that I highlighted and and had notes to because maybe they'll be a little bit more important. Um, and then as I get to a point, if I'm not uh, covering anything you want, just uh, just go ahead and rewind and, and hit whatever you wanted. Um, in 61, middle of the page, he says, I'm convinced that the principal difficulties in studying Hebrew are due to the adoption of Latin forms, which have caused a simple and easy tongue 
to become a species of scholastic phantom whose difficulty is proverbial. A lot of people uh, have this comment concerning Latin. People that study it seriously, people who have looked at it uh, enough to understand um, just the, the marked difference between even Hebrew, um, Masoretic, and Latin. It, it, there is a marked difference. There's probably a uh, there's probably far more of a similarity between, uh, <clears throat> let's just say, Jerome's Vulgate and modern King's English than there is between Obri or even Hebrew and the Vulgate. Um, I did write a note on this. I, I said uh, this is a good time to note how it is Jerome. Uh, who is the character, in quotes, because he's funny. He shows up as the validation for a number of things that I find to be suspicious. He's responsible for the Latin Vulgate. Uh, not only do I find this translation following rules of modern Masoretic. Now consider, he was supposed to have uh, done his Vulgate translation in around the 4th century area. And the fact that it would follow the, the rules of, of modern Masoretic in many, many ways, I guess that's either going to put people in one direction, believing that the uh, Masoretes were steering us in the right direction, <laughs> or they, they should probably smell a rat. It, the same with the Septuagint. It's the same thing. You can see the Septuagint clearly following rules of modern Masoretic, and it should it should worry people. I don't know why it doesn't more often. Um, and I'm going to leave out the other stuff. You know, Jerome is one of the leading sources that many people who have written books on geography, the geography of Palestine and, and the Transjordan. Jerome is one of the three main sources that they quote in essentially forming the, um, the locations of biblical places in Palestine, the Transjordan, the Negev, and Egypt, along with Eusebius, which is another shady character. Again, I'm not sure he's a person, certainly a character. <laughs> And Flavius Josephus, those three. I thought that was important enough to note that the same guy who is responsible for the Latin Vulgate, which is uh, the basis, again, of a number of English translations or English thought. He is also one of the chief sources for um, the early chief sources for the geographic marriage of the Levant with the Bible. Uh, let's see. He goes on to say it's necessary, this is just the next paragraph, to set aside the ridiculous prejudice that has been formed concerning it and be fully persuaded that the first difficulties of the characters being overcome, all that is necessary is six months closely sustained application. Now that's pretty amazing as far as I'm concerned. Now that, of course it Perhaps it would be coming from the fact that this guy is already a, had mastered, I don't know, four to six languages by this time. Um, I'm really eager to see, of course, how his application of that works, because I haven't found that to be the case. And perhaps it's because I find him to be relying, in my opinion, far too much on certain aspects of the Masoretic form, not only the form of the characters and the idea uh, of letters, um, but also on a certain amount of the lexicon. I see him in a way relying on to a degree. Um, and if this guy is sincere, I have to worry that that's perhaps his downfall in, in some aspects. Um, because I, I don't know. I guess a super genius maybe could uh, could get it figured out in that kind of time. But uh, 
Well, he, it's quite an he assertion. Does, he does apply that caveat initially. Um, and be fully persuaded that the first difficulties of the characters being overcome. So once you're familiar with the characters, then six months of practice would render you, um, I, I guess you could say fluent. That, um, you know, I've been questioning Dolivet this entire time, but when I read that, and I'm only now realizing it, I just took him at his word, and that made me feel better. <laughs> I was like, okay, six be months good. of hard work. That sounds nice. That'd be good. That'd be good. That would be good. <laughs> it doesn't explain all of my migraines. It doesn't explain my uh, emotional breakdowns. It doesn't account for those at all, but that would be really good. If from this point forward, I could do another six months, that would be really, 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 really good. Um. <clears throat> So I, I think we might have to just chalk that up as um, another it's claim. Subjective. We'll have to see if it manifests. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, you know, I highlighted a little bit in the next paragraph, but I'm not worried about it. Now, on page 62, he says, from that time, nothing is found by which we can infer that the Jews possessed a grammar. At least it is certain that the crude dialect which was current in Jerusalem at the time of Jesus Christ and which is found employed in the Talmud of that city, reads more like a barbarous jargon than like an idiom subject to fixed rules. Now, he does, he really does uh, talk more in the future about the, what Masoretic is and what he believes and his take on Masoretic, I find pretty fascinating because I have not yet seen somebody apply this perspective to where they believe that it came from. However, I believe that he is, if not right on the money, and we will get to that. It won't be in these sections, but it'll be coming up very soon. Um, if he's not right on the money, he's extremely close. Uh, I wrote in my notes, um, well, I said exactly, but there's no proof the Talmud was in existence at the time of Jesus. That's kind of a, that's one of those assumptions that I really wish people would, would sort of uh, get over. And I thought I turned the volume off on my phone. I said the traditions of the elders and the Talmud, they, they do have uh, a lot of radical differences. And I, I commented on this uh, on episode one. We have deviance of Christianity everywhere today in the church. And that's not to suggest that they would imagine something so abominable as a lot of the ideas we see in the Talmud or Kabbalistic writings uh, in general. And, you know, talking to people who are pretty familiar with not only uh, modern Hebrew, which isn't exactly what the Masoretes formulated, when let's just say when they they solidified it a few hundred years ago during the time of uh in within the the leningrad uh codex or or the bhs um they they'll tell you that uh for one thing a lot of these rabbinic writings and this is really important too this is very important there many of them not penned even in masoretic hebrew they're penned in Aramaic. They're penned in Aramaic. Um, and when they are penned in Hebrew, they're not, there, there isn't a, like I've said, um, concerning, let's just say, this, the, the Bible and the various forms of Masoretic that once existed before they standardized it this would be precisely why he would say that there's so much variation and I would think just the variations. And I know a lot of people aren't aware that this is how, uh, in depth it gets, but it does. There isn't a, a standard. And I would go so far as to say that there are even a number of forms that they use of Aramee or Aramaic as well. 
I would have to say that this is precisely why he says that. Um, unless you it's, had something to add to that, I was going to read one more part of a paragraph, but go ahead. Just, just the to English speakers, if you were to, <laughs> if you were to read a sentence and translate a Latin sentence, it sounds like a barbarous jargon as well, because our speech is so particular. So, I mm. mean, it, it goes against the things he said not two pages ago. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, it, all right. What he says after this, I didn't really, I don't know that I necessarily took issue with, but he did say com immediately following that, that Jeremiah, for example, who is a man of the people, wrote evidently without any understanding of his tongue, not concerning himself either with gender, number, or verbal tense, whilst Isaiah, on the contrary, whose instruction had been most complete, observes rigorously those modifications and prides himself on writing with as much elegance as purity. Now, the one thing that I would have to add there is that now, first, I haven't even attempted to read these in Masoretic Hebrew in years. I've been reading them without. Now, without, I see very little difference in the forms used between Jeremiah and Isaiah. There are, um, there are certain authors in certain books who do use certain forms of words that are a little bit different than others. I would have to believe then he's basing this opinion more heavily on what he sees coming through in Masoretic um, than what he's actually seeing in the form of the word. Uh, again, though, if he's if he's only doing the the first ten chapters of Genesis, he's really not going to have any time to prove this to us. Obviously. He's trying to make a point, and he's equivocating the writings of uh, the Talmud or Kabbalistic writings with variances that he sees in Jeremiah and Isaiah. I'm just simply saying I haven't seen those same kinds of variances, and he's not giving us examples, so I can't really argue against it, unfortunately. So I don't think any reader has any reason to take him at his word per se, because he's, he's just really not giving us good examples. Yeah. I am. Um, I latched on to the part where he says, "Not concerning himself with gender, number, or verbal tense," mm -hmm. and well, the ovary has no numbers. I mean, a man, yeah. a man reading this language um, with our particular bent would would actually consider that vulgar. And there, simple. Th there are there are two forms in at least the base numbers. Now they don't, of course, know that Obri doesn't have numbers. It has words that represent amounts. There are um, different forms that commentators will tell you are the difference between cardinal and ordinal. The problem is I don't know that that's the case. I want to clear that up too. Um, because there's many times when I see these base numbers used in contexts, grammatical contexts, where they seem like they ought to be ordinal and they're cardinal, or they ought to be cardinal and they're ordinal. Um, a classic example of this is, has, has thrown people off for as long as people have been uh, giving heed to the Masoretic text, and that is in Genesis 1. It starts off with, uh, and the evening and the morning was uh, Ahad, Yum Ahad. Okay, so it's cardinal, but then it goes into forms after that that are supposed to be ordinal. Again, though, I I'm trying to stress this uh, to anyone listening is that those rules that they have applied they don't just they don't just put their nicudote onto words and parse them out through that they also take 
word forms that I'm sure are working in a certain way on a certain level in a different grammatical form in a different way. And they tell us things like that form is cardinal and that form is ordinal. Whereas when you take away the Masoretic and you start looking at it in its own form, grammar, you'll see that that rule doesn't always apply. So I'm not calling D'Alive necessarily ignorant because I don't think I'm uh, all that well-educated. Obviously, if the guy speaks that many languages, he's well-educated. But um, unfortunately, it just seems like he's uh, reverting back to trusting that the form that the Masoretes are using or applying to this language actually have any kind of validity to them. I agree. So, um, let's see. Now, I did, uh, I did highlight his footnote uh, at the end here, just part of it, on Maimonides. He says this judicious writer teaches that as the greater part of the words offer in Hebrew a generic, universal, and almost always uncertain meaning, it is necessary to understand the sphere of activity which they embrace in their diverse acceptations so as to apply that which agrees best with the matter of which he is treating. The notes on this, uh, I put that uh, typical, what, what I consider what Maimonides w was saying, I thought it was, it was typical sophistry. Um, a guy who definitely said one thing to the masses and thought a very different thing privately. Um, the Bible is not one brief unidirectional book such as the Quran with its surahs, or so particular as the Vedas with their hymns, proverbs, and detached mystical events. The Bible incorporates origins, history, genealogy, geography, particular events, laws, relationships, topographies, psalms, proverbs, prophecy, etc., so that words and word families may be tested over a multitude of contexts to determine their precise meaning. And that, right there, I hope, is what's going to give all of those who may be budding students considering looking at this language outside of the Masoretic some kind of hope. Because if it was uh, within the context of a book that was mostly very unilateral, they might really have a hard time. Fortunately, the Bible, just in the Old Testament, let's just say just in the 39 accepted c currently canonized books, there really is that many different forms of grammar and dialogue available to test these words within, and that's the beauty of it. That's why I've been sticking with it for so long, because the the highest number, if you take any word, if you didn't know the meaning of it, the greater amount of contexts that you could find it within, uh, the greater your chances are of getting a very, very precise definition and understanding of that word. And that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> Do you have... Um, any any remarks or anything you want to bring up on on that section? No, I am completely out of my element here. Okay. As <laughs> I was, um, I said to you earlier, um, I think last week that um, to the uninitiated, Dolive just drags you into the forest and tells you he's your only way back to town. And yeah. this is this is the point in the book at which I'm beginning to feel this way. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, but uh, keep in mind, and this for anybody, including me, because there's going to be times when he's going to try to talk over my head, too. And sometimes it's going to work and sometimes it's not. He has to prove every claim. Everybody always has to prove every claim. Um, a claim without evidence is just that. It shouldn't even be entertained if there's nothing. Um, you know, I consider even loose circumstantial evidence as evidence. So he's going to have to provide something as we go. I'm just going to do my best in the in the portions that uh, maybe even I don't understand. Let's just say completely what he's getting at um, to make these things a point and to remember them so that as we go forward, um, I can recall that he made these claims and is he ponying up the proof or not? Um, so section three is his divisions of grammar or parts of speech. Now, this is a really interesting one uh, just because this is where he lays out some very serious possibilities. He uh, articulates his belief in the structure of good night. Everybody wants to call me now. And I really thought I put this on silent. I guess I didn't. You're popular. Yeah. Um, anyways, um, he says right from the beginning that modern grammarians have varied greatly concerning the number of what they call parts of speech. This is, this is so instructive when he gets into the various parts of speech because I'm hoping that it's going to illustrate how far we've fallen, if you will. Um, he goes on to say that these diverse modifications and these words of many kinds have, as I have said, tried the sagacity of the grammarian. Plato and his disciples only recognized two kinds, the noun and the verb, neglecting in this the more ancient opinion, which according to the testimony of Dionysus, of Halicarnassus and Quintilian admitted three, the noun, the verb, and the conjunction. Aristotle, more to draw away from the doctrine of Plato than to approach that of the ancients, counted four, the noun, the verb, the article, and the conjunction. The Stoics acknowledged five, distinguishing the noun as proper and appellative. Soon the Greek grammarians and after them the Latins separated the pronoun from the noun, the adverb from the verb, the preposition from the conjunction, and the interjection from the article. Among the moderns, some have wished to distinguish the adjective from the noun, others to join them. Again, some have united the article with the adjective and others the pronoun with the noun. Nearly all have brought into their work the spirit of the system or prejudices of their school. Court de Gebelin, who should have preferred the simplicity of Plato to the profusion of the Latin grammatists, has had the weakness to follow the latter, and even to surpass them by counting ten parts of speech and giving the participle as one of them. Now, I did, I thought this would actually be helpful. I know that I went through that pretty quickly, um, but here's the thing. If I can get this, if I can get this note box to come all the way out, because it doesn't really seem to want to, it wants to hide itself, unfortunately, behind. Good night. The note box won't come out. If it doesn't come out, then I can't tell everybody what it's saying. Oh my gosh. Here we go. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I, I did go through and, um, and I wrote these things out just, just to be very clear. So he's giving us first off a, a progression of the simplicity, which he claims in the last section. He believes that Hebrew as it once existed, that I call Obery, was far simpler. And he says, and they go from recognizing that you have a noun and a verb. So a noun, and I took all of these from the, the same dictionary source. 
Um, and I think it was all taken from the GNU version of the Collaborative International Dictionary of English. Um, so the noun, a word used as the designation or appellation of a creature or thing existing in fact or in thought, a substantive and a verb, a word which affirms or predicates something of some person or thing, a part of speech expressing being, action, or the suffering of action. Now, if there were older languages that were mainly just recognizing, may maybe we shouldn't say that those were the only two parts of speech. Uh, however, those were the only two really important parts of speech. Everything else was, and of course we'll get to this in, in, in both his assertions to what he believes are the parts of original Hebrew. Um, but I do also want to cover a bit of what Harris, the, uh, the uh, rhetorician, has to say. Um, and then you have the addition of the conjunction, a conjunction being a connective or connecting word, um, indeclinable word which serves to join together sentences, clauses of a sentence or word, an article, this is what Aristotle adds, right? The article, one of three words, a, an, the, used before nouns to limit or define their application. A or an is called the indefinite article, and the definite article, um, the is the definite article. Uh, the Stoics, they add the proper noun, a name belonging to an individual by which it is distinguished from others of the same class opposed to common rules as John Boston, America, appellative noun is common as opposed to the proper noun denominative of class. Okay, and then and then all of the um, all of the extras added by the Greek and Latin grammarians uh, and, and the Stoics. Now I'm not sure if I agree with that declension um, that he he lists. I don't know. He doesn't produce source. And of course I couldn't find source and it would have taken forever. I think to find these sources to, uh, to verify, um, the belief by these various philosophers and not all of them are necessarily philosophers, um, grammaticians or grammarians that these were the only, parts of speech or important parts of speech. Um, but I think here's what I think is the great illustration is the fact that we certainly have come to a point as he illustrated with court to Geblin of his 10 parts of speech. Many of them I think could be easily argued as far as what really is their purpose use strength their need for their existence whatsoever. Do you have anything to this, yeah. add to all of that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, uh, while I'm familiar with the schools of thought that follow the big names, uh, Aristotle, Plato, the Stoics, um, and the Greeks, uh, sure, this, this actually does follow the natural progression of a thing whence a people seek to codify it. And so you have initially two parts of grammar when they say what is speech, what is language, what is a sentence, what do you make it of? So you condense it. So we have the two parts. Later the three, the four, the six, the ten. Because later people say, yes, this was true. However, it's not as simple as that person said. There's also this and this. And so we must specialize and specialize and particularize. And later on, someone comes back, looks over the bodies of work and says, no, it's actually much simpler. You're just thinking of it particularly. And so I feel that this entire first page of division of grammar is one long-standing uh, example 
of the universal versus the particular in grammar. And we see it played out through history. What would you say is the smallest amount of parts that one would need to convey a thought? What's the simplest? This is just an exercise in, in communicating. You know, whether or not, whether or not a language is um, excessive or whether it's appropriate and frugal, you know, there, there are, I mean, if you, if you read articles or books on grammar, you have your basics, you know, there are people that would say that you either need, you really need um, a subject and verb or an object and verb. Um, or you need an adjective and verb, you know, there's uh, always two parts. Yeah. I've never heard anybody go to the point to where they could, uh, just one part could ever actually convey a thought. Yeah. Um, for me and a part of why this is so interesting is because I, I wonder if I'm going to read this idea later or at some point for me, it's three. What is it? What is it doing? Noun, verb, and who's saying it to you? Mm -hmm. If if it's if the noun is you and the verb is sleep, mm -hmm. is it your child saying it to you, or is it your mother saying it to you? I mean, sure. I, I think that that because language that's important. is an agreed upon set of sounds and glyphs yeah. it who is doing the agreeing with you will completely change yeah. it so uh, yeah i'm waiting for that to pop up whether whether the well, condition of personhood exists interesting thing we will see that in obri we will see things like a first person something coming from a first person perspective you know a second person perspective you know um Interestingly enough, though, those things are, are actually padded right into the words themselves. Um, that would simplify it a millionfold. Uh, and to somebody yeah. who couldn't get that point or had never considered it, then it would sound like the crude jargon <laughs> of a people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't know of... I'm sure they exist, but I don't know of other languages that incorporate or build roots in the way that this does, because I don't know of any other language that has the same type of glyphic structure that this does. Um, and one thing I'm eager to find out, because I haven't found this out yet, I really don't know, I have some, some ideas, um, is the nature of relationship of any particular glyph depending on the role that it's playing in the words. That was one of the first sparks that I ever had was reading an article on hieroglyphics. And this was based mostly on the work of, um, Champollion, um, which a lot of people disagree with. Um, but the, the thing that was so interesting about it was Talking about hieroglyphics, the, the glyphs part of hieroglyphics, because it's a language that, that's supposed to be made up of pictographs as well as letters. And the interesting thing about the glyph part of it, the, the pictograph or ideograms, was that if you change their orientation to a word, that could change the entire word because of the orientation of that thing to the rest of the word. And that is precisely how I see a number of glyphs, maybe not all, but at least a number of glyphs in Obri behaving. Um, that's so we're, that's we're going go ahead. quite, that's quite well echoed in um, studies and presentations done on Hebrew, wherein they make the, the, glyphs and the forms in 3d mm -hmm. and there's there's a there's a i cannot remember who did it 
the problem is what they're doing with them. Aliphatorus. Uh huh. Yeah, he has a wonderful argument on it, but that may just be uh, <laughs> an example of Hamarsha. <laughs> you miss the mark if mm-hmm. you see it the way he says it, but it, it may still hold true mm-hmm. despite his misleading. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I think it's safe, um, prudent for anyone to consider, for one thing, any rabbi teaching any of these things, to look at what they're teaching. If they're teaching it to Goyim, look at it as artful speaking. It's the same kind of principle that Masons use, um, that people who are doing cryptology use. They and their religion and their beliefs are not for export to the Goyim, but they do believe in artful speaking. So there's there's going to be a number of extractions. It's not going to be easy. None of this is going to come easy. Good grief. I wish it would. Um, but it's not. So I would imagine that we can get truth from just about anyone, little bits and pieces. I mean, I can't tell you how many uh, bits that I've extracted from Jeff Benner's work. And he runs the Ancient Hebrew Research Center. And I, I, I don't vouch for a number of his conclusions or his methods, but I certainly have picked up a lot from it. That's for sure. Well, um, that's, that's the serial killer complex. And they will tell you the truth with complete faith that you'll never understand it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, So speaking of not understanding it, the next paragraph, he does lay out his belief in the fourth parts of speech. Now, probably wasn't entirely fair of me to say not understanding it, but what I'm interested in, I'm, I'm very much chomping at the bit, is to see this applied as we go forward in the book. He says, and I kind of feel like I should read the two things together, not only his belief in the four parts of speech, but I really want to read the footnote that he wrote about that, the English grammarian, Harris. Okay. So to start with, Dialve says, I shall recognize in the Hebraic tongue only three parts of speech produced by a fourth, which they in their turn produce. These three parts are the noun, the verb, and the relation. And he he puts in the words as representative, Shem, now I'm going to pronounce them as far as Obri, and they, they pronounce different in Hebrew. Shem, which is actually the same in Obri as Hebrew. Pol, which he would pronounce Fahal in Hebrew. And Meleh, which is mala in Hebrew. The fourth is the sign, out, which is about the same in Masoretic with a TH, but I would pronounce with a hard H. At, it's usually, you're going to usually see it as at. You'll less often see it with the uh, U in the middle. Now, it's an interesting um, formulation that he has, and that's why I said I'm, I'm really looking forward to it because I personally haven't really seen this formulation and in fact um i'll be dead honest with everybody i haven't yet figured out the particular rhyme or reason to the the word at um which is usually made up of the um the ah uh which is akin to our modern a and the te, which is akin to our modern t, sometimes it has that u in the middle, um, because you will see you will see certain phrases, certain sentences, certain thoughts expressed that don't even use that sign. And it is that is the Obri word for sign. You see it right in Genesis one for signs and seasons, the stars in the sky. At. Um, but I haven't yet determined what exactly the, the, the reason for this is, which is why I'm so interested in seeing what he believes Does, the use is. Absolutely. 
Does that yeah. does that T end with a T, or is it T? Is it a hard T like at, or do you do you follow that through? Would it you know be I s- at? No. Um, okay. So Sorry when to I get started, into that. I just no, no. Thought... That's okay. Phonetics are important. Their phonetics are extremely important. Um, yeah. Uh, so what I started was just applying Western sounds, the most common Western sounds, um, both consonantal and vowel sounds, to to these glyphs, and I, I actually began by putting a hard sound on the the letter that I call tha, which uh, the Masoretic would call it uh, tet. And I put a softer sound on what the Masoretes called tav that I call ta. It's the last glyph in the alphabet. I've never actually placed any kind of sound after it. And just because I was always worried, um, for one thing, I never really thought about it, but... I would just say that I wouldn't because I would worry that that might imply some sort of a vowel after. And the thing is, there are so often times you're going to find um, the glyph eh, like our modern E, at the end of words. And it, it, it works as a softener, in a sense, at the end of a word. It, it works as a... Um, um, oh, uh, come on, think. The proper noun, <laughs> proper and appellative. So it works as ah. as making something into a proper noun at the front, and when it's in the back, if if it makes a noun, let's say, more important by putting it at the front, at the back it makes it, in a sense, softer or less important. Not the whole thing. It would be like... um. And if if you were going to go to within 50 feet or 100 feet of a particular oak tree, but you weren't going right to the tree, you weren't going to be right there at the tree, but you were going to be in vicinity, you would put that eh at the end. And that would say that you were in its vicinity. If you put it at the beginning, of course, you're making it into a proper noun. It would be like the tree. If it was the most important tree to your story or in the world, you'd put that at the beginning. Now, I know I went way further than what you just asked, but I am saying that there's a reason that that particular vowel sound is at the end of of a lot of words. No, that helps. And I would be very concerned about expressing any kind of of vowel vocalization after, after anything, be, because of those the importance and and how it can change things, you know. So with the the tha, if it's at the end of the word, um, it just gets the th sound. I guess I I end words uh, in a very dead way, depending specifically on what I understand uh, the consonant to be. Uh, I did. I did make just a few notes on the words that he associates with his four parts of speech. He associated, um, let's see, Shem with the noun from H8033. Uh, it's translated there. Now, it Shem's translated in a lot of different ways. It can be translated as name, as a noun, there as a noun. Or as a proper name, Shem. Now, he he equates this word pole with verb. That's H6466. That there's, um, well, it's 66 and 7. So it's translated as works, acts, deeds, or workers. And it, in fact, is a noun. The male relation H4405 translated word, speech, or matter used predominantly in books of poetic verse, like Job, Psalms, or Proverbs. That's what he's using as his um, symbol word for relation. And then we already went through uh, the sign. Before I talk a little bit about Harris, um, 
was there anything that you wanted to add to to any of that interject yeah, yeah please this in this entire paragraph is um is two cabalistic sentences with his four part total um my instant idea was the tetragrammaton and um I began to look into why so many uh, occultists enjoy Dolave, and this popped up. So I thought that was interesting. If anybody actually has any knowledge of people who speak of Dolave, I'd love to see it. This is a shout out to anybody listening, but I'm starting to find more and more Kabbalistic links. Um, in his work as we go on in his work really that mm -hmm. would be good to know well anybody with any further information it would be yeah post post links in the text for as long as i'm on youtube <laughs> post links in youtube they obviously aren't listening to anything that i do and that's why i'm still here so as long as i am or or i provide both of our i'll be putting both of our emails on there i didn't realize i didn't have nathan's email on the last two yeah yeah he's a big one i was surprised to find out how popular he was um with the occultists and the cabalists because you would think no but yeah because he seems to attack um rabbis and masoretics but you know again artful speaking now he does make a footnote on this English grammarian named Harris. And this is one of my favorite parts because this was, uh, when I first read it, this was kind of the eureka moment I had. Um, not that he are, he brought up a, a concept that I wasn't aware of. It's just that he, in a sense, articulated it a little bit closer than I had up to that point. He says he's better a better rep, re, rhetorician than able dialectician. Uh, he has perhaps believed himself nearer to Plato and Aristotle by recognizing at first only two things in nature, the substance and the attribute, and by dividing the words into principles and accessories. According to him, one should regard as principal words the substantive and the attributive, or attributive, sorry, in other words, the noun and the verb. As accessory words, the definitive and the connective, that is to say, the article and the conjunction. Thus, this writer, worthy pupil of Locke, not a trustworthy guy, but far from being a disciple of Plato, regards the, the very only as an attribute of the noun. To think, he said, is an attrib attribute of man. To be white is an attribute of of the swan, to fly is an attribute of the eagle, etc. It's difficult by making such grammars to go far in the understanding of speech, to deny the absolute existence of the verb, or to make it an attribute of the substance. I keep expecting him to say attributive, and he's not. He's saying attribute. I, I'm putting the wrong emphasis on the wrong syllable. Of the substance is to be very far from Plato, who comprises it in the very essence of language. Okay, <clears throat> but very near to cannabis, who makes the soul of faculty of the body. I'd hate to be somebody named cannabis. That'd be unfortunate. Um, you so have I, a dyslexia. What's that? Cabanus. Cabanus instead of cannabis. Yeah, no, I, I read the word as cannabis the first time, too. <laughs> maybe it's maybe it's because I'm on cannabis. Maybe that dyslexia. I'm really not, folks. Don't start rumors. I'm really not. I'm on I'm on serious chemo, and it's like being a real heavy social drinker. <laughs> Unfortunately. All that. Okay. What's that? Nothing. That just sounded fun for a second, and then I realized it's chemo. <laughs> Wait. Yeah. Hey. Oh, no, not the good stuff. You don't get any of that. You just get the bad stuff where the next day you can't remember uh, the bad things you did. Kind of like that, except I suppose it, it makes me dyslexic. 
Now, I did write the substance. Now, this is really interesting. The most important element in any existence, the characteristic and essential components of anything, the main part, essential import or purport, an attribute, a word that qualifies a noun, a characteristic or quality of a thing. And I did also include principle, a fundamental essence, particularly one producing a given quality, an accessory, that which belongs to something else deemed the principle, something additional and subordinate, an attachment. The reason that I spent so much time on that footnote, I highlighted it, and I wanted to give the exact definitions, at least according to one dictionary, is I think that's actually closer to what I've observed in Aubrey than what I'm seeing D'Alive and his parts. However, there are there are parts, uh, features to Aubrey that I am not entirely sure of. Which, I mean, already I've actually gleaned a lot of information from D'Alive himself, not something he's passing on from anybody, which I think is extremely valuable. Of course, when you're handling D'Alive, you really have to handle him as likely an occultist, <laughs> whether you can prove it or not. Um, so this goes back to what I was saying for a very long time, stumbling through things, trying to say, you know, there's these words and I don't know how to describe it, but I couldn't really articulate how I was constantly seeing roots, whether they be biglyph or triglyph roots that were being used as verbs. They were being used as nouns and they were being used as descriptives. So adjective and adverb. Mm -hmm. Now, Besides that, you have words in between them that are probably relationship words that are typically made up of usually uh, kind of like individual glyphs that have been married together. You're never going to see one glyph by itself ever unless the Masoretes have left their cantillation marks in there. Um, so it's always you always have to have two glyphs or more in, in an Obrey word. Um, but that's what I started seeing was, and, and I would describe it more like I was possibly seeing substance and attribute, um, and principle and accessory rather than seeing nouns and verbs with conjunctions. Although, unfortunately, when I think these things out in my head, which I'm trying to break myself of. I, th I, I make these translations in my head exactly like we do in modern English. So I'm going to have the butts, um, you know, unfortunately, like the word Asher in Obery. It can mean like happiness or blessing, but it's, it's also really often used for uh, our modern English equivalent, which you know, like not not the that cast the spells, but as a, a transitional word, maybe a relationship word, you know. So so it becomes from a definitive to an either or descriptive. Um are you talking about that particular word? Mm -hmm. Asher? Yeah. That that example it it completely changes the classification. Well, I guess, uh, all right, let me start with saying that certainly the, what he's saying from, from Miller in, in those parts of the words are definitely night and day different, I think, than what he's saying. Um, but I guess what I meant was when I look at these, I'm still very much, I'm very much stuck in looking at a word, knowing what it is, 
in Obery, and even what it oftentimes is, is representing pictorially, because I have a number of words that I can, I can look at, and I know pictorially that they're representing something apart greater than what their parts are as just, say, a phonetic language are. The problem is that when I trans, when I read it, I'm still trying to break myself of translating it in my head into the parts of modern English that we use, like all of those parts that, you know, Mm -hmm. we went over from, from Plato on forward. Um, and that's, that's really, uh, I'm going to speculate that that's probably going to be one of the most difficult things for anyone to do is to get to that point where um, nearly everything you read in that language, you're reading in a way that you're understanding it, uh, its sort of pictographic value, its mm-hmm. attribute, its substance, and the... Let's just say the movement glyphs um, in between that that are getting you from here to there without putting that English filter on them before it it goes into your processing centers. Yes, to grasp it without converting it. Yeah. I I had this difficulty when, um, when reading any language based on Latin because Mm -hmm. I... I would uh, I would translate it, and I found that as I'm translating, I think it's twelve different things, and then I finish, and I realize that it was nothing that I thought until I grasped the thing as a whole. And so now, when I read, I thankfully I no longer need to to translate unless I need exactitude because context and key words are enough to grasp it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I, I do suppose that once initial familiarity of the glyph set and what it does uh, comes into mind, that, that sort of work will be easier to do. That's one of the nicest things about trying to grasp another language is that when you can get the concepts, you're going to find that m- most people are going to find this to be true, that... Once they get the concepts, it's far easier to read that language than it is to try to communicate with somebody in that language. Now, I've never tried to communicate with somebody in Obri because nobody really exists that that speaks it actively. But what I mean is you don't really have to to think about all of the things that you're going to have to do to relay this to someone else. And you can just absorb. Um, Yes. And it makes it far easier because then you can concentrate mostly on things like um, archetypes, which is good because it probably has a lot to do with universal as opposed to particular. And maybe that was really the main thrust that flew over my head in the first place when he was speaking of the two, universal and particular. Obviously, there's going to be certain thoughts that Somebody's going to have that may be expressed in very different ways. But once you start understanding that, uh, m- does make it a little bit easier to to read in this language. The only really unfortunate thing is that I believe at this point in time, the the range of thought based on um, how many roots there are and the potential for variations beyond those roots is far 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 broader than what we understand in our modern languages today, especially English. I know that might be kind of hard to grab onto because, you know, we might, I've got a dictionary here. It's a, it's a Webster's encyclopedic dictionary. It's gigantic. It's gigantic. The amount of words, I don't even know how many words are in there, but I'm seriously trying to say that because there's a lot of repeats. There's a lot of things that are very repetitive. And there's a lot of direct synonyms all through there. 
Mm-hmm. Um, in Obri, you're not going to get a direct synonym. I reject that because I don't think that there's any point then if you're getting direct synonyms um, to having a language that's based on glyphs and acts in the way that it does. It's it's either impossible or pointless to have synonyms. So at this point in time, I completely reject them. Um, it's I, funny that you say. Ahead. It's funny that you say. Um, depends on who's saying it. With all of that, I mean, I, as I said earlier, I'm I'm waiting for that classification to creep into the ideas the mm-hmm. the <clears throat> the use of formality in japanese language um i would call you jonathan san or nisan or kun mm-hmm. um adding adding onto your name your title all in one word and yeah that would that would let you know how formal it was, but also tell you my role in comparison to you. And so. Sure. Um, it's very similar in German, but not combining the words. Yeah. Ah, yes. And with, with the cultures, what do you see? You see a stricter adherence to tradition in Japanese than, than German or today. Maybe it wasn't always the case, yeah. but we have this, we have this strict formality. It is always observed. It's it's not in addition to the language. It is the language. Yeah. Yeah, they're inextricable. And, um, you know, I really didn't want to read necessarily the highlights that I made on the last two pages, per se. But I, I did want to read a bit of the notes that I took. For instance, he has, of course, he has a whole paragraph on page 67, concerning the sign. Now, I read that very carefully and then Mm -hmm. uh, a few times made notes. um, And in the notes, I said that anyone who has spent enough time in Obri slash Hebrew is familiar with the sign, at or out. Um, Those who read the Bible in any other language will not be. It becomes invisible, essentially. There appears to be a redundancy to it due to the way that we understand language structure today. So I give the the first line that you're going to see in the Bible is Genesis 1, 1. Uh, Bereshit bara aliyim at eshemaim u at eretz. In English, once we surmount the subject and the verb, Bereshit bara aliyim we would see the object as obvious, like Eshemaim and Eretz. So what's being said there is um, Barashit is uh, essentially an equivalent to at first fruits. Bara is your your verb and Aliim is, is your uh, ob- uh, subject. Okay, so Bara is the creation part. Aliim is the, the subject. Um, and and then you have these two objects. You have a Shemaim, the heavens, and Eretz, the earth. Um, and th- that's what I was saying. In English, we would we would just see that as obvious because we have this this obvious uh, expectation when we see a sentence or an idea that we're going to see essentially um, subject ob- uh, subject verb and object. Okay, so we 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 wouldn't even see those really. We would we would wonder why the redundancy. I mean, I have before. Now you take Genesis thirty one twenty six, the first statement. Uh, Uyamer Leban, uh, Yokeb. There's no sign, and we have object, subject, and verb. There's no at. Uh, it appears in the question. Um, me oshiu, um, u iganab at lababi u ineg at banati. In the next verse, it's used with the pronoun ati. So it's literally used with a my pronoun 
after it in the next verse. And what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm, I'm giving you a little bit of a, of a under the microscope of what I had just said about the inexplicable oddity that I haven't began to understand yet about the sign at, uh, -huh. um, I don't doubt that to some degree we inherited our word at from this. Uh, we've inherited a lot of words actually from Obrey. Surprising. Uh, does it act prepositionally? But if so, because they, they do say that. They say that uh, in Masoretic, it, it, it is either um, signaling your, your object or it's acting prepositionally. It's signaling preposition that doesn't always work. Uh, but they'll come up with ways to sort of make it work or just sweep it under the carpet. Um, what I want to know if that was the case, why so the frequent redundancy and, again, um, inconsistency. Like I just said, I just read a statement in which we would, we would kind of want to see the sign because, again, the, the whole of Genesis, all I did was read from portions of Genesis. They're all the same narrator. They're, they're all coming from um, uh, the same point of view as far as who the speaker is. Mm -hmm. But we're seeing completely different grammatical structures. And sometimes we see the sign and sometimes we don't. There would have to be some sort of rhyme or reason to it. If not, it's a bit of an exercise in insanity. You, you can't just put things wherever for kicks. You, you can't just have redundancies for no reason. So obviously there's a reason, and I'm just currently not aware of it. In fact, when I read this stuff, um, I guess this relates to what I was just saying about uh, getting around translation in English uh, in your head. Um in some ways, that at, because I don't entirely understand it, unless it's sign, and I'll see it, and I'll think sign, because that, besides for it being given the quality of, let's say, pointing to the object or signaling a preposition, which I do not apply because that's just more confusing, um, I'll think of it as sign. Or I'll honestly oftentimes think of it as at like our modern English. And the thing is, it works. It works like that a, a great amount of the time, not all the time, because the structure is just so different. Um, I'm possessed of a, of a wild idea. What if sign is not the word that it meant? Could it be substituted? It just grammar maybe. and punctuation are so frequently stressed. And they're two separate things. Yeah. You can actually have good grammar with no punctuation. Uh, they, they teach this in school. Um, a sentence with or without the quote-unquote Oxford comma. Yeah. But this is, <laughs> this is really funny because in the current state of translations and guides, punctuation is still not making up for what appears to be bad grammar. Yeah. Based on, on the translations. You know, one thing it could be, because I've discovered this in other roots um, that start with the ah, uh, um, some of them are actually indicating the voice that you want to read what is coming after in a particular voice. Believe it or not. Huh. Um, I've determined that one word that starts with the ah, and I can't remember it unless I bring up that document, that it's actually more likely determining voice than punctuating or connecting or relating words. Now, it's possible when you... When you look at the glyphs themselves, you have the ah, uh, which more often than not, it seems to act, especially in first position, as augmentative, one way or another. Um, and then you look at the ta, which 
I don't know if it changes from first position to second. I don't know that all of these do. Um, certainly seems to indicate a mark, literally a mark. Um, now I don't know exactly if that strong or augmentive mark, um, if that's exactly what it's saying. And remember, sometimes when you put the ooh in between, depending, it, it can actually change the word quite a bit. It can actually change it very little. Um, Whoa. So, and it, and it all depends on what the glyphs are on either side of that ooh when you put it in there as an affixed in the middle. He, he does comment on it in the last paragraph here. He actually believes it to be really interesting. He believes that, that, that the ooh, which is, is very akin to our modern U, um, and that they call Vav usually is, um, is more like a flame. Whereas most of the guys teaching uh, what they would call Paleo Hebrew or ancient Hebrew is going to they're, they're going to say that it's something like a a a hook in a sense, and, and you could see how that would work because it, ooh is, is almost always starting a new thought. You're going to see that ooh, and it also is a divider yet connector between. Let's say you're getting a list of cities that the Israelites inherited, and there's like 10 or 20 of them, you're going to see an ooh between each one. It's going to tell you if that city has two to three words in the name, then you shouldn't see an ooh until the next city is named. You see how it, it adds, but it also divides. Yes, the Spanish the Spanish is the letter Y. Okay, yes, exactly. Um, now, it works very similarly, because Spanish is very similar to Obri in a lot of weird ways. Yeah. <laughs> Spanish now, has retained a lot of Obri words, strangely. There's yeah. that, that funny statement that I read once that Spanish and Japanese are closer than Spanish and English. And, <laughs> and it's always rang true. Yeah. Uh, now, before I forget this, uh, T or T is Mark, yes? That's that that's 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 one of them as a secondary and uh yeah. the first one could be a voice, right? Maybe. You see, um, I'm just giving now, you as far as I'm, the T goes, that's yeah. that's the that's the status quo. And and it seems to work. It, it would, seems to work at least part of the time. So go with that. It would speak uh it would speak to our understanding of the word sign, because when we when we say sign or read sign uh, in the scripture in the Apocrypha, it, it actually doesn't mean a sign. It doesn't mean writing on a board. It means yeah. something completely uh, different. It means mark of God or some sort of mark word of God. Think. So I mean, what do we think a sign is? You know, I mean, what yeah. what can a sign be? You know, Anything. I didn't put the I didn't put the definition of that in there. Yeah, and so I mean. Just in my mind, as you were going, I chased those, I chased those glyphs back around. Completely. So I guess it would be interesting. And the stars as yeah. marks of God. Yeah. Now I guess it would be interesting or, if yeah. that were the case to apply that to what we would see as maybe um, more commonplace statements that have that at in there mm -hmm. as a sign, a mark. What is it signaling? If it's a signal, what is it signaling? That's what I was actually very pleased, though, that I saw that he included it as one part of speech. Mm -hmm. Because he's going to have to now, he's going to be forced to justify that, to use it, to use it quite a bit. And we're going to get probably a lot of use out of it. Whether or not he is doing it on the up and up, whether or not he's being honest or correct we're still going to get a lot of mileage out of it. And I'm very glad of because that so far has been a bit of a mystery. Um, I'm actually glad that we talked about that a bit because it's going to help me um, now that I see it in the text, thinking more of it as far as is this sign? Is it sign all the time, which it should be? 
I also don't believe in in parsing words. I think that their flavor can be changed depending on their context, but uh, I don't believe in the kind of Masoretic parsing that's done. And see how that that can be applied, because that's very interesting. Um, Especially when you get down to those biglyph roots, um, the way that they're often used, which seems contextually different, um, I don't know that that it necessarily is. And that's... Probably the most mysterious word in Hebrew because yeah. yeah, it is, it is a lot of times you'll, you'll read, you know, um, the so-called experts will just kind of they'll give you definitions that say in a real smart sounding way, we don't know. <laughs> and it's, it's hard to sound really smart. And at the same time, you know, say, I don't know, there's actually no reason why I'm paid, um, six figures a year. I can't give you a good reason for that, but, you know, I'm going to try to sound smart doing it. Yeah, I respectfully <laughs> decline to comment. Oh. <laughs> yeah, now, that's a that's, smarter way to do it. I'm probably going to bat that biglyph around in my head for a while because if if the I is voice, and mm-hmm. and forgive me while I talk this out so mm-hmm. I, can, I yeah. can understand, if the I is voice, as we say voice in the terms of grammar, um, your voice is is who's speaking, sure. But can you tell who's speaking? Does the voice come through? Ah, it's harsh. also used as a prefix in first person perspective. If you were to say, I ran, you're going to use the ah. Like, okay. Ran. Yeah. So I denoting... A voice or a character also Mm -hmm. can be used in first person. First person. So (laughs) the identifying mark or the identifying character. So a sign still universally comes out in my head as a sign. I'm going to have to take a look at that. Um, Good for that. Yes. Yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, I think we could, I think we could try for, since it's going to be like two weeks in between, I think we could try to at least go up to page 118 and see what happens. Uh, 118 in the book or your PDF number? In the book. Okay. Yeah. I learned my lesson last, last time (laughs) when I was doing the PDF numbers. So no, I'm looking at the pages in the book. Yeah. Because going up to 118 brings us right before chapter five. And I know enough from looking ahead at, at this stuff that a lot of what he's doing in here is in a sense, it's repetitious and he is Mm -hmm. trying to, um, really, form a basis for our views and opinions, uh, I guess, on the glyphs. Now, you know, even if he had done this in only four or five pages, I don't know how long it'll take to actually properly address that material. I don't know if we'll do it fast or not, but I just think that that amount of reading is probably like totally on par, probably pretty good to go up to, to page 118. You know, okay. by next time. Yeah, we're we will definitely get stuck on page seventy five. Yeah. Um just because he he throws out this statement, the Hebraic alphabet is that of the Chaldeans, and then uh elucidates with Sumerian and Assyrian points and yeah. he, he dips into the Book of Kings. Yeah. So that's that's gonna be uh slow going throughout those seventy 75 through 78. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah. yeah. And he has other claims in here that, that I'm going to really attack at some points. Really, it's going to get brutal, but, um, you know, I don't care if that has to happen over a couple of sessions, you know, it is what it is. I don't really yeah. want to rush it. So I, I just think that, that taking it up to that point is good. In, instead of, you know, breaking it off halfway there, we can just go to, you know, before chapter five and however long it takes to work through that information. Fine. I don't care. You know, it's good for me. I just wanted to actually go through those few sections in just a couple of hours only because I thought we could simply because he 
you know, obviously I, he does make claims, but <laughs> the, the meat is going to be ahead of this where he actually has to prove them out. So that's where, you know, things might go kind of long. So, uh, all yeah, right. No this was, uh, again, as usual, very good. I learned a lot. Um, I hope everybody else uh, did as well. I hope they uh, really understood what we were trying to, to, to get at and what we were saying. Um, again, you know, anyone who has any questions or anything constructive to add, feel free to contact either one of us. Our contact information will be in the description. So um, until next time, thank you for joining me, Nathan. We'll see everybody then.